Barbara, Brent, and Jeremy. Thank you very much for your time. Mm -hmm. Thank you. All Thanks right. for having us. Be here. Yeah, yeah. This is the first time we're doing it this format. Uh, so one of you has been on the show before, so you already know that answer. But we're gonna we're gonna switch it up the traditional first question at the moment, and instead just do some uh, some brief intros. So uh, Barbara, you're in the top left hand corner of my Zoom Brady Bunch screen. So how about we start with you? Okay. <clears throat> so thank you for having me, and thank you for Jeremy. Uh, thank you, Jeremy, for thinking of me. Um, so I'm in California, in Marin, and I'm a somatic psychotherapist with a particular interest in movement and mostly movement as a form of becoming and as a form of transformation, transfiguration, and transmutation. <laughs> and we're in short order for it all right now on the planet as we have to re-envision sort of what it means to be human and also our modes of existence. As I do this uh, talk, as you know, we've had major fires here in California and it's been very intense. We've been living with smoke and so we're wearing masks for COVID and wildfire smoke that has not really cleared for about two weeks, choking um, smoke. So we sort of are in a bit of a crisis here in California. And so just been monitoring my own body and my own practice of how to be uh, living and becoming in with crises. So I'm really happy to be gathered here with two great people that I respect and love and to talk about this. Lovely, that's a really good one. Um, Brent, you've been on the show before. I, Jeremy, I thought you had, but it turns out I was thinking when I was on yours. So we'll start with you, Jeremy. Um, you do a little bit of an intro too. Sure, sure. Well, uh, thank you once again, Gordon, for this invitation to have all of us on. Uh, my name is Jeremy Johnson. I am a consciousness studies researcher slash scholar, uh, publisher over at Revelor Press. Uh, an editor, and I'm also author of this book you see behind me here, which I'm trying to rep, <laughs> Seeing Through the World, uh, Integral Consciousness, uh, Gene Gebser, Integral Consciousness. And um, yeah, I guess I'm very interested in the same or similar vein of, of inquiry too, which is, you know, how do we understand the rich and dynamic and complex history of consciousness as it has evolved through the human being and also in the non-human world and uh, what relevancy, what application, what insight uh, can looking at that subject matter uh, apply to the planetary crisis we're in right now? You know, what is the context of uh, everything going on and how, do this, how does this relate to a mutation in consciousness or breakdown or breakthrough or both? Um, I guess I should also mention I'm the host of Mutations Podcast, which is where you were, Gordon. Uh, yes. At the, at the end of, of 2019, and which was published latently in 2020, as things were starting to intensify, um, perhaps appropriately, uh, the, the timing was even even better in terms of our conversation. So uh, yeah, yeah um, I, think, I think that's it for, for my little brief introduction for the moment. Yeah. Nice one. And Brandt, of course, reintroduce yourself. Yeah, uh, well, I'm a... Uh practitioner and teacher of classical Chinese medicine. And my primary focus, um, like Barbara, is in the realm of bringing Chinese medicine, I should say, back to the table um, in, the, in the discussion of somatics and consciousness. And my main, the main thrust of my work is also involved precisely with exploring where does consciousness emerge from within the human experience and how how can we trace back within from the lens of Chinese medicine a view that brings us back into an animist perspective to the more than human world and how can we see that representing origin and connecting that to Gebser's thought and seeing how that's emerging through us and in fact that many of the types of structures that are described as making up the body as a constantly renewing autopoetic emergence are actually expressions of precisely origin as us expressing itself. And that 
within that internal milieu, we will find a way, find within that internal milieu, the pathways and the lines of flight, which our bodies are constantly creating that will allow us to stay with the trouble as we move through this crisis. I like it. I like it. It occurs to me, uh, just as you were saying that, Brant, that we've sort of got different, uh, different iterations. I think I understand anyway, of like Gebs is standing here. So there's like Jeremy, who obviously you've got a book about <laughs> behind, behind you about him in the show, like mutations is, is um, named for some of the ways um, Gebs had described his exploration of consciousness. And I really enjoyed what you said there, Brand, about the overlap um, between um, where something like uh, traditional Chinese medicine and this exploration of consciousness um, overlap and are in fruitful dialogue and what they can say about each other. And I think, Barbara, I've got it right that um, are you like, your way to Gebsa was originally through someone like Ken Wilber. Is that fair? Or did you find Gebsa first? If I, have I got that wrong? Or how did you, how did you first encounter him? <clears throat> so actually, I came to movement uh, first through a woman named Emily Conrad, who isn't alive anymore. And she developed a form of movement called Continuum. And so I studied with Emily Conrad for 30 years. And um, <clears throat> through my students really, my students were teaching me that there was more, that the, the body was, is almost like the next species was wanting to come forward. But the first thing it had to do was exfoliate this mechanic, mechanistic identity, which was not its own. So I often would just provide space really for bodies to have permission to just be a body. So that means not a lot of telling people how to move, not even having a lot of form, but just a warm, um, safe place for a body to unfold what it wanted to unfold. And I was astonished with what I was seeing in my students because just through simple movements like bending, turning, twisting, moving, there seemed to be sort of, as I say, a dissolution of some kind of identity that was not really comfortable anymore. And so people were really happy that I provided a space where they could sort of do this and not have somebody say, why are you doing that? Or that looks weird. Like, don't do that. I didn't do any of that. I, I'm, I always think of Lynn Margulis. I was more thinking like I was looking through a, a microscope in a laboratory and I was watching an organism and I was watching how the organism spoke to me. And the more I was fascinated with what was coming through, the more it came through. It's almost like the person could feel sort of my um, non-judgmental attitude but not only that but an excitement about something else an excitement about becoming more an excitement about um, new modes of existence and new flights you know new 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 vectors of information new angles new just new everything and um so um then uh when i came across gebser's work i was fascinated first of all just by the very statement the ever-present origin yeah that stopped my mind just like when i heard sri aurobindo and the mother's work talk about the human just being a rung on the ladder of evolution these two statements were statements that just stopped my mind and it was almost like i now had permission to bring forth some kind of originary wisdom that was not rational, but that was somatic, that was cellular, I would even say even pre-cellular, like molecular. Um, and so when I, when I heard about Gebser and met Jeremy, and um, you know, Jeremy's book was really, uh, really big for me because Gebser was difficult to read, um, but um, Jeremy parsed it down really nicely. And then we had some wonderful conversations where I felt like something was being ignited. 
And, you know, Gebser talked about a verition. Something has to come to verition. Just through, uh, re you know, reading Gebser and talking with Jeremy, there was this verition, intensification of what was already happening in me. So I really feel Gebser's work was definitely a transmission of primordial wisdom. Um, and uh, even like now, when I go back to it, I still, because I read some stuff today just in preparation for the talk, and it was like I was reading it, I've read it over before, you know, but it was almost like it was talking to me again in a different way. So it's, it's, it's definitely wisdom that is, um, has a genesis to it, I guess it would be the best word to describe it. I like that. And I, uh, it, it's funny, you kind of picked up on the next question, which I was going to probably give to Jeremy. Um, and I'll do that now. But so I know what you mean about the, the phrase ever present origin. Uh, there's something about how that's characterized that is um, multidimensionally true, I guess, like you go, that is the exact correct description of what is in fact under discussion. So that's a really interesting one. But for like Jeremy, I suppose we should start and I'm going to do it this way and ask you, was Gebser a weird kid? Uh, and, then, <laughs> and then what it was, because he had the most, he had the most amazing life, right? And, and when I say amazing, like we were just talking about things like the fires in, in California and so on. Some of it could have been better, <laughs> um, mm -hmm. but he had the most incredible life. But uh, we'll, we'll do the weird kid question for him. And then sort of like what Barbara picked up on there, um, what was it originally, what was the first time he came into your life and what was the idea or phrase or something that you heard that started you on your um, Gebserian journey, I guess? Mm. I, I'm honored to be able to answer. <laughs> was Gebser a weird kid? Um, I think he was, and, and honestly, it's, it's more of a, a, in a tragic sense that he was, because when he was very young, he lost his, his sister. And he talks about this in his biographical notes, just about how the loss of his sister at a young age kind of created this relationship with death mm -hmm. and the dead in a way that sort of left him kind of adjacent uh, to himself in a way and, and to, to other children his age, left him with this kind of spiritual crisis of, of, of uh, what he called eventually primordial trust, right? Uh, of attempting to um, open up to the problem of death and to feel in a sense that, you know, a part of him is already in the realm of the dead. Um, and so he's, yes, I, I guess I would say he definitely started out as, as a weird kid. And I think it really informed his, his early years kind of um, as this bohemian, bohemian artistic poetic scholar, you know, uh, in, in wanderlust through, through Europe, sort of tracking the biography of Rilke and hanging out with poets in Spain like Lorca and really kind of interested in these poetic spiritual questions, the problem of death, um, uh, the spirituality of Rilke, the changes in, in, in attitudes and the mentality that of, uh, of, of the Spanish poets and of uh, modern artistic movements in, in Europe, et cetera. So I think he always had this poetic mystical bent. And even though he's sort of seen as this um, dense, difficult to parse um, Germanic writer, right? The tome Ever Present Origin, which is the only major text that has been translated into English is very challenging to read. It's very dense, but he has, I think if you read between the lines and see some of his earlier works and his other translations, that there is this poetic sense to him and it's a spiritual sense. Yeah. Um, and I'm that's- I'm gonna interrupt there because it, it triggered something for me, which I think is relevant. A poet, he, the book is so big and dense because um, that's why you write poetry. Like a, a, a poem is, if you do it right, is an ever-present origin tome. And if you don't write a poem, you have to write ever-present origin. Do you know what I mean? So I think when you're talking about the him having that Germanic, which is fair, like he was, was sort of, like I think he was Polish originally, but whatever it is. Um, but it's, it's, yeah, it, it's kind of binary, Austria, right? right? Like you either write a poem or you write ever-present origin. And so he, <laughs> he looks like this, but he looks like this because he's trying to like explore this, get trapped. Yeah. yeah. 
Yes, and, and there, there's a good uh, counterpart to Ever Present Origin for the Curious. Um, uh, Aaron Cheek has translated it. It's called The Winter Poem. And uh, Gepser's editor of his collected works, Rudolf Hammerly, who is also a friend uh, of his as well, has commented that there's a poem version of Ever Present Origin if you're interested in checking it out. And it is this winter poem, which in the span, I think, of what, um, 45 minutes or so, he kind of wrote it all down and it's without editing it, it sort of expresses and crystallizes what EPO or Ever Present Origin is really attempting to articulate in poetic expression, in poetic form. Um, but but yes, absolutely. And, and uh, I guess this is also an answer to your second question, right? Which is, you know, how did I come across Gepser's work? Um, I had heard of him before. He was sort of mentioned in different consciousness literature when I was younger, kind of reading um, some countercultural literature. And Wilbur, of course, Ken Wilbur mentions him frequently and even utilizes some of his, his more conceptual framework to talk about integral theory. But I hadn't actually read Gepser uh, until undergrad when I was doing a private study with Tehard, actually, and just studying Tehard's work. And like, well, let me check out Gepser too. Wilbur's always mentioning Gepser and Tehard and Aurobindo and Integral Yoga. So let me read Gepser next. And it, the very first page, the fir first line in the translation is, origin is ever present. Mm -hmm. uh, so immediately I'm like, this is interesting. Like, where, where's the, where's the, uh, the references to meta abstract stages of development and transpersonal psychology, none of that was there. There was this, it was, yes, it was difficult to read, but there was this poetic sensibility in his writing that I think even managed to make it through the translation. And I think from the very first page, I was completely hooked. I'm like, something is being transmitted in this writing and it is present on the first page. So uh, I've never really gotten away from it. <laughs> no, I like it, I like it. Well, it, uh, the, the childhood's interesting, but it's also, it's not just the Spanish poets, was it? I mean, you kind of expect him to be in the background of pictures or photographs of, of all these kind of famous people. And he is in some of them, right? Like, I mean, it was, it was Picasso in Paris and he was at Jung's first conference and whatever. Like if you're looking at the 20th century, European 20th century exploration of things like consciousness and creativity. He's just sort of like somewhere in the room. And so my question for Brandt is, uh, do you think, do you think enough people who are interested in this kind of world know that? Um, and what was it about his ideas? Cause you, you come at it from a different angle as well. What was it about, or the initial thing in his ideas that uh, kind of pulled you in as well? So, okay. Do First you think, question. Do you think people know, like, he's no like, one know, not enough people know about Gebser, one hundred percent, and it's a tragedy in my opinion because it because exactly his point of contact, his point of contact with so many avenues of twentieth cent of great import in twenty in the twentieth century, around literature, art, psychology consciousness, philosophy, cultural studies is profound. I, 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 I can connect it to, it can be connected so meaningfully to um, Aurobindo. I mean, literally, literally Gebser saying that he feels that he was within the, within the, the kind of vibration that was emitting emerging from Aurobindo that actually inspired his work, which he viewed also consciously as being in a European context in a way that's, in a way that's, that's not, ex, not exclusivist, you know, and not, not at all. It, it's just a direct exploration of what emerges through his consciousness. And it's a model of, it's a model for all of us, really, what we, exactly what we need to be doing. Mm -hmm. And his attention, his awareness emerging ultimately that it was a part of this kind of spanda from Aurobindo, that's profound. And, and, and his, his recognition of that and his ability to, to articulate it is also equally important, I think, as a model. Um, and I, I discovered Gebser through... I, I don't know how I came across it, but I discovered Gebser through Aaron Cheek's essay, Rendering Darkness and Light Vis Present. 
And if that's not yin and yang, um, there's no better way to describe yin and yang as rendering dark and light present. And in a sense, the way that that, can, the way that that gained such significance to me was that it was speaking to experiences that I had had practicing Chinese medicine in the eruption of, of time freedom. And it totally altered experiences of time that, ha- that were just part and parcel of how I approach practicing Chinese medicine. And then to see it explained in such detail, I had never had any affinity for Wilbur whatsoever. Same. And I have an extraordinary, an extraordinary passion for neologisms and Gebser alone is the 20th century pillar of the neologism as far as I'm concerned. So uh, <laughs> that alone, I, just on the basis of the neologisms, I could have, I could have grown to adore Gebser. I like that. So that, um, I, I'll throw it over to the three of you and see who wants to take it now. There's, there's kind of two things there that I think are really interesting and I want to kind of form as the foundation of this discussion or at least have as the, the main part of it. Gebser has which is very post-Hegelian, like an aeonics model, right? Like uh, he has a model for the development of or the expression of human consciousness through history. Uh, and that's kind of like his, his um, big thing there. Now, uh, uh, maybe it's a Jeremy thing to explain um, sort of concisely what that is in the levels, but it, what you brought up there, Brand, is one of the interesting things about that is the next question on, which is, is that universally applied? So you found an interface with um, traditional Chinese medicine, but there are, as far as I can tell, is it, is it too Western developmental? Like he does explicitly call out that this is the development of Western consciousness. So what is this framework and, and how do we use it in the 21st century when, when looking cross-culturally with um, more sensitive tools, I guess. Who wants to go? For, uh, who wants to describe it okay, for us? Can I jump in real quick, Jeremy? Yeah. And, yeah, and then, easy. so, so one of the things that I discovered is when I learned about when I learned about Gebser's statement about catching the influence from Aurobindo, I began to study Aurobindo. When in studying Aurobindo, I found that there was a Chinese national that came to live in the Aurobindo ashram. And he sent a letter to one of his students or colleagues in China and said, if you want to explore the Tao Te Ching, come to Aurobindo's ashram because we're living the Tao Te Ching here. Oh, that's lovely. So if you imagine that you've got Aurobindo here and, a, and some, some vibration emerging, coursing through Europe, influencing World War II in multiple ways through his process, in, which is emerging, as Barbara said, from a deeper than cellular recognition of conscious awareness. Mm-hmm. And then you have, through the agency of this Chinese person, Chinese philosopher, another vibration moving into China. The only comparable, you know, you know a comparable model we can look at is you take, the, you take like Witzel's origin of the world's mythologies you look, at the, you look at the iconography of fire and you see that exactly the same thing emerges, has emerged through time. The same vibration has been emerging through time from central points, which have been placed at the location where intense consciousness mutations were happening, that they're always emerging. They're nested centers, nested cores, emanating out towards peripheries in all directions. I like Gebser it. articulates that. Yeah. So you kind of ran to where I, th- I figured we'd l- um, land the show, which is that and we need to do the model of consciousness now, but I think how we, how we use things like, and not just Gebser, Jung and, and everyone else who gave it their best shot, um, mm-hmm. being Europeans in, at a certain time in history, is we need like a model for models of consciousness that allows us to, and, and I think you kind of articulated what yours is there, which is like, it's not 
we don't have to look at it as, and this is really diminishing, and you know what I mean by it. We don't have to look at it as like Eurosplaining. We look at it as an example from within a European context of something that um, is universally applied, which is models for consciousness are found elsewhere. So we kind of need a model to have models of consciousness in dialogue is how I would describe that, but it's, that's where we got. <laughs> that was my kind of like end of the show. Um, and I'm glad, I'm glad you articulated it, Brent, because you sit in one of the, like professionally, you sit in one of those areas where it's like, well, um, what is the model for having models? Uh, and, and, and that I think is a really good one. And I love, obviously, cause I like, you know, cycle theories. I love the idea of, um, of the radio wave metaphor for it, right? So it's that kind of one update signal that you can kind of identify in towers around the planet, I guess. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, that's, mm -hmm. all right, um, we've, we've kind of talked about uh, a model for models. Let, let's talk about the model, Jeremy. So, uh, so how, how does, as briefly as possible for it is a very large book. Um, what does he think is going on with human consciousness through time? Mm. So, yeah, yeah, uh, tall order. But, uh, you know, again, when speaking of like titles that's, that, that do the thing that they're speaking of, I think um, Cheek's essay, Rendering Darkness in Light Present, is itself what the model is attempting to describe in terms of the process in which consciousness is rendering darkness and is rendering light present. And so I think with, with, with Gebser, which makes him more so, and this is my own, my own bias and, and of, of course favorism towards him, but makes him more cosmopolitan or um, not as Eurocentric, although there is some Eurocentrism tinged in his writing being at the time when he was writing. Um, and being European, like. And being European, yeah. yeah. I mean, his yeah. <laughs> situatedness, you know, and in history and context, et cetera. But uh, despite that, or, or because of that very conscious awareness of where he was placed, he was able to articulate a, as he, as he even says, it, it's not a developmentalist trajectory in which Europe is at the height of this evolution of consciousness. Rather, there are these kind of multimodal creative expressions of being in the world, different orientations of self, space, and time, and that they all kind of are, they're all co-present in humanity as a whole. So, so we have that going for them in terms of uh, perhaps global application, but then um, they're not so darkness and light need to come together. Like we have the night, we have the day. And in a very similar sense, like with different states of consciousness, right? We have deep dreaming, we have dreaming, we have wakefulness. And so Gebser saw these different orientations like the structures of consciousness as complementary, as fluidic, as dynamic, as interrelated. And even though they had a kind of moment of, of uh, um, let's say a predominance in a particular culture, uh, a general orientation, they're all co constantly at work. They're always interplaying with each other. And so to even kind of see it in a tr developmental Eurocentric trajectory is, is to kind of throw out actually what Gebser was doing, which is to say that if we as enlightened rationalists are looking back at um, a magical animistic past as somehow some lower stage of development, we're only actually myopically looking at our own kind of uh, sense of uh, superiority and our wakefulness, but the, uh, the, 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 the darkness is needed, right? The realm of the dead is present. And so I, I, I appreciate Gebser because of his capacity to be so liminal about these different structures of consciousness. Mm -hmm. He could still kind of say like, okay, yeah, we, we're more materialist in the kind of rationalistic spatial sense today, but that by no means precludes um, the efficiencies and brilliance, brilliances of the deep past that is still very much within us too. And that's another thing that I think is very interesting in his model is that the, the earlier forms of consciousness aren't um, distantiated stages. They're all co-present. They're always at work in the present. And so to really talk about any time, you have to talk about everything, all of time. Right, really. Um, there's a sort of simultaneity of the structures. Now, that's probably a bad way to describe the model, but, you know, in, in terms no, it's, of it's like... an important point, like, because if you compare it to another, and this is a simplified one, but if you look at <clears throat> the Thelemic model of the, the different eons or something, right? Mm -hmm. um, they, you've got the mother, then the father, then the child. And, and that's kind of like um, 
a, a sort of thousand yard or 10,000 foot view of like how Crowley thinks um, spirituality and, and spirit um, are experienced across the millennia. Uh, and and Gebser has obviously a better one, um, and, and not just because it has more phases, but kind of like more importantly, um, they are in fact co-present because that's one of the challenges, right? It, it, from memory, it's like archaic, magical, mythic, mm -hmm. Um, and then whatever the one we're in now and moving into. Yeah, yeah uh, the mental and then <clears throat> integral, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and it's important to say there, um, different sort of frameworks are present as, as, cause you're not necessarily moving through them through time. It's, uh, and this is the challenge with the work, right? And it's the, unfortunately Barbara has to do this one cause it, um, <laughs> this is the challenge of the work, the, the, the model we're moving into or the, the framework, the, the sort of state of consciousness we're moving into hinges or swings on a different experience of time amongst other things. So mm -hmm. it's kind of like, well, you can stack them, but to stack them is, is a, is a mental rational experience of, of consciousness through time. And kind of like one of the points that he was, I believe getting at is that, is not what the next experience is. So you get caught in this sort of loop. But so um, the question for Barbara, um, and it's, it's the first like real curveball, I guess, is um, how do we experience or um, uncover that, that like novel um, mode of consciousness? And, and like, I think I want to, I want to talk more about the, the body work and the process there, because like the spoiler is, well, um, not using the same tools that we um, encountered or experienced the previous consciousness from. But like, mm -hmm. how, how is that for you? Well, um, Jeremy knows this about me, that I'm very excited about the new science and particularly the microbiome. Um, we now know that, you know, we've mapped the microbiome and our human body is mostly microbial. We actually have 150 times more DNA that's microbial than human DNA. So <clears throat> I believe this is a game changer because it literally is saying we actually have an ontology now for that's integral and that is ever present, uh, is origin, uh, it, it, it's actually originary uh, origin uh, reassembled into a human body. In fact, we, our human origins can be traced back to uh, one single salt bacteria now called LUCA. And all evolution has sort of complexified from this one single salt bacteria, including the human body. So basically we have a science to show that the body is, a, is an a assemblage of cells and organisms and genes and you could even sort of argue plant kingdom fungi everything sort of reassembled restructured in and shaping what we call now a human body so that and, and and it's it's not static it's fluid it's always changing in fact you know i could eat supper and my microbiome will change in response to what i ate um, the fires the last couple of days, just, I left my home, uh, in, uh, central Marin and moved next to the water because my friend had a house next to the water. And so I moved in here and I could see the microorganisms around the water had eaten some of the smoke, the smoke had cleared. So even, you know, uh, the microorganisms that are inwardly in our body and then outwardly are impacting us all the time. And we are responding and receptive to all of that. Um, some of us more consciously than others, obviously, but in my teaching now, I always talk about the human body in terms of the new science. I try to dismantle as much as I can this Cartesian idea of a body divided into parts. Um, the body doesn't know it's divided into parts. That's a Cartesian mindset that we put on the body. The body is this one integral organism where everything is connected via 
feedback loops and vast networks where everything is constantly monitoring and responding. And there's like interpenetration and intermingling and entanglements of microbes, sharing genes, sharing nucleotides, making sympoetic arrangements. I mean, if we had a microscope and could see what was happening inside of our human body every moment, even after we eat, after we have a nap, after, you know, do our sit at the t table all day, at a desk all day versus be out in nature, um, you know, near, near the seashore, you would see this kaleidoscope and assemblage uh, shifting and changing and being responsive to the conditions around it. So, you know, this idea that origin is ever present in us and is always looking for a way to actually participate with us. We're participating in origin and origin is participating in us. Just like when I moved here to the water next to the salt water, I could feel the smoke had cleared enough that I could breathe better. So origin was participating in my own sense of how, you know, fight or flight and if I could relax versus when I went back to my home, which was in a little valley and the smoke just mm. collected in the valley and I couldn't breathe at all. So it's interesting how, you know, we, we have this relationship that's happening all the time, but it's not rational, it's not conceptual. It is happening on a, on a biological level and it is fluid and restructuring and constantly changing. And we have so much autonomy and agency to influence that, that reorganization. Just choosing a diet or exercise can have you know, this impact upon how my body is responding as an organism. Nice. So it's very exciting time, I think, to be to be in a body, to have a have a have an ontology of becoming that is not about um, you know dualism, but about sympoeses and possibilities of becoming. Um, and the more we understand how much creativity we actually have with regard to this, eating mushrooms, for example, taking herbs, these are all things that replenish our own originary um, plenum. I like to use that word, Jeremy uses that word too, plenum. You know, this is like a raw material of, ori of originary nature. How do I want to dance with this? How do I want to intimately? intersect with this. I mean, this is a mode of existence. It's not just a thought, it's a vehicle for existence. And, and we have all of this creative capability to actually, uh, you know, render it. That's re I, I really respond to that because what you're talking about with the new science stuff uh, applies um, in we're building a permaculture farm down here. And one of the things, the processes that permaculture is going through is a very similar one. Of, we could call it new agriculture, but it's, it's bringing that, uh, uh, that continuity of inside and outside and, and a general custodianship model rather than a top down, um, put NPK fertilizer on the ground and, and, and grow things much more, um, much more about participating in the microbial flourishing of, of the land under management. And so it's, it's getting to that level of holistic design. And, and so I'm going to ask Brand a similar question, like how do we be with this moment? Um, like how do we activate being with a, um, a long-term change in consciousness? And then we're going to talk about like the fun, well, it's, it's fun in a way, um, not fun to go through, but it's fun to talk about that the, the arrival of novel, consciousness modes is disruptive <laughs> let's put it that way but i mean how, how for you in i mean is this part of how you see your practice how how do how are we how do we participate with these kind of like novel um modes of consciousness i suppose so in a sense it's like we don't we participate with this through the activity of attention 
-hmm. as attention becomes with its light touch becomes the vehicle for awareness to come into contact with the physical body, which is, as Barbara suggested eloquently, is so sympoetic, so, so simultaneous, as Jeremy was saying, all of the processes in the body happening all of the time, an aspect of your self right now is living out the precise moment that is the midpoint of your birth and your death. And at the same time is the 242 thousands of metabolic processes which are happening right this second, as well as manifesting the totality of your being as a series of seven or eight year cycles of maturity. All of those things, when we can see them happening simultaneously and we can find a way to perceive them with direct perception, we, we come into contact with the awareness which is emerging from the simultaneous activity of all those systems. Mm -hmm. The systems communicate to us. We don't interact with the system. Mm -hmm. They communicate to us and we just stay with it. I like it. That's what that's what I call that's what I call a causal intention, which is the term that prior to my first talk with the Gebser conference, I made contact with Gebser and he gave me a couple tips. And one of them was you've got to figure out what a causal in what he said was you've got to figure out what a causal intention is. And that's precisely exactly Barbara, what you're saying. It's like in, in even the way that you described your practice, Chinese medicine comes into that same mode when it is an a, when it has embodies an a causal intention, which allows a connection back to the, origin Mm -hmm. so that from that from that state any set of potentials the plenty potentiality of origin is allowed to express itself because of the joining of attention and awareness yeah you know that so that's the model and the beauty of that is we can train ourselves to feel that through the pulse because the great vehicle of what is it in our bodies that has structure that conveys the fastest moving and most significant influences through the body, the cardiovascular system and the nervous system. How are they similar? They're these bifurcating uh, constructal expressions which are capable of channeling the most, the force that the, through, the green, that through the green fuse drives the flower, the veriditas of life itself moving through the blood vessels, moving through the nervous system as yang impulses, which have to be appropriately spiralized so that they can, so that they can stay in activity. It's cool. And that's what all the functions of the organs are. Mm -hmm. Um, I like that the meeting place, what you said there about the meeting place of um, attention and awareness is, um, is, very indigenous in its thinking like there's there's a lot in Gebser that overlaps with obviously phenomenology but like with an indigenous way of of being Mm -hmm. uh alive i guess like indigenous models or frameworks of being alive so jeremy is there anything you want to add to like how do we be this be with this moment before we get into because i i haven't read ever present origin i came by my uh, Gebser knowledge, mostly via Gary Luckman, because I've read all his books a bunch of times and uh, he's been profoundly influenced. I think he dedicated one of his books to Gebser. Um, so it, it's in Secret Teachers of the West and Secret History of um, Consciousness and so on. Um, so I kind of know Gebser, the, when Gary puts him in dialogue with other European thinkers that have been very influential uh, on him. And one of the things that stuck with me, I, um, I love a good cycle model and I love a good aonics model. And, and one of the things I particularly like about um, Gebser's, why it puts it somewhere near the top, is it doesn't just say the previous epoch, like we'll just use it as, as a definition of time rather than structures for simplicity's sake. It doesn't say the previous epoch is trash. Um, and now we're in a good one. Uh, so it's not like a dissolving of the last one. What it does say is it, it in fact has really good things about it and, and is an accurate way of being in the world until it hits a point and then goes into a state of decline, right? 
So um, I want to talk about how we are, and as, it, as the new structure builds itself out of you know, consciousness and our experience, that is hugely disruptive like on the material, um, in, in the material sense, right? So we go through effectively an apocalypse <laughs> to, to get to the next kind of state. So um, that's, I wanna have a final um, topic area around how, um, what Gebser saw as good in the mental rational and when, and how he conceived it when it kind of hit the decline point and, and started to sort of not work or, or not be, the the um the appropriate mode for being in the world anymore because i think that's really illustrative but before we get to it i'll give you a, a, a shot of that previous one there jeremy like how do we be with this change um in in structure is there anything you want to add to that yeah i think um they're they're interrelated in the sense that how do we stay with the trouble in this moment right is is exactly the kind of sense making and spiritual investigation that is completely relevant to the emergent consciousness, right? So I'm I'm gonna kind of jump into the next question Go. by by um, precluding it with the sense of uh, Gebser talks about the mental consciousness as this capacity of the human being to have directed directed senses, right? A directed thought. And he even talks about rect in the German language. And he takes, um, he's great with his etymology. He talks about mental and the etymology of mental as well as a kind of wrathful, uh, a wrathfulness, a wrathful directed intentionality, a volitionality. So there's this um, wonderful capacity to self-express with directed thought in the mental. And what goes along with that is also this capacity to, in a, in a certain sense, he talks about, you know, um, the kind of myth, mythology about going forth and doing your duty in the Bhagavad Gita or uh, the wrath of Achilles. So there's a sort of a directed wrathfulness of the mental consciousness, which expresses itself in space and in linear time in that sense as well. It's associated with the maturation of this of the ego right of, of the self sense to proclaim m odysseus or i am odysseus which we would say which wasn't at the time in the original uh in the text uh, there was no i there which i know julian Jaynes talks about as well but so there is this directed self sense that the mental has and really i, I love the the term Gepser gave you, Brent, in the sense of a causal intention, because that's a wonderful way to talk about what Gepser describes in this emergent consciousness, which is ego freedom oriented, right? Um, how can we still have the wonderful expressions and capacities of the mental without being so centered in the anthropocentric, in the self-centric anymore, without completely undoing that, right? So a causal intention is a great way to talk about it. Uh, Gebser talks about a sort of, um, this word is really sticking with me today, and I was reviewing notes, a senseful awaring uh, of consciousness, right? Instead of directed senses, we have a senseful awaring of this, mm -hmm. of, of presence, right? And there's a participatory capacity in this that needs to open up in the human being, which is origin is ever present. Uh, the moment is this dynamic influx of all of these different processes spread across time and space and different modalities of time and space. We can't conceptually capture all of that in the, in the mental consciousness, in this abstract ego. We need to open up to an intensification of our own capacity for senseful a wearing, or a causal intention to be able to participate in it, right? Because it's already happening to us. So in, in the context of this moment, uh, one of the other phrases that comes to mind is uh, what Gebster says, you know, so much of what is happening today in the context of the crisis is happening of itself, right? Mm -hmm. The planet is becoming, is expressing its integrality and we will either be destroyed by that by refusing to work with it and open up, or we can become present, we can slow down, like uh, Bayo Akamalafe talks about the, the becoming, times are, um, we're in a kind of a crisis, so we need to actually slow down, have a slow urgency, right? So there's this sort of coming to the earth, coming to presence, opening up. And I think in that presencing, uh, the, the, the key here for integral consciousness is, uh, a deep presence of not only our multidimensionality, but a living past, right? So you mentioned archaic consciousness, animism, et cetera. 
all of that still participates. Um, and the future. So we have to be listening to our ancestors, but also the unborn. Like, can we be so present that, that we are moved in, in the creative present, not only by the dead, but by what we are going to engender, uh, what is latent in the present as well? Like, can we be so here in, and participate in origin in such a way that the past and the future are creatively participating with us here, right? And I think that this is the, the crisis that Gebser talks about. And we can, uh, I'll, I'll pause in a moment, but when he's talking about the whole history of this crisis and what it's culminated in, it's this relationship to time, the spiritual open relationship to time that uh, not only Western civilization, but of course now our global capitalistic civilization is, is hell bent on escaping, right? We want to continue that directed, controlling, um, uh, extractive potential and power, but there's a helplessness in that, right? And so Gebser talks about this sort of um, um, running away from us of the machine world and of time and how integral to this crisis is an intensification of time, feeling like history is speeding up, feeling like we're mm -hmm. out of control of, of uh, the political and the technological and the economic. And there's almost a sense of uh, Thanatos in this, in the, in the kind of suicide oriented civilization that we appear to be in. And mm -hmm. so his response is this, well, we, this is only going to be um, uh, overwhelming for, for those of us who don't do that very difficult work of overcoming the structure of consciousness in ourselves yeah. um, that is responsible for, for this crisis. It's the best thing. Like, it's basically saying this is just what happens now. And, and I, I, I put it, I like it in a, we, we've got to get back to where, because it's intellectually interesting where he thought the decline started. But I put it alongside Charles Fort's model, which is kind of like my preferred aeonics model, um, where the, in, in the previous dominant, the things that um, the dominant described, they described as literally and correctly true. So as we move into the dominant of wider inclusions, which broadly approximates what um, Gebs is talking about, the epistemology of the previous dominant, like it literally generates false facts, like it doesn't work anymore. It doesn't create the true things that it used to. So, and we're seeing that in politics and in medicine and in economics and, and, and what Gebser kind of calls to attention is that sort of what Fort does as well. This is just what happens now. Don't, you don't fix it by yelling at it or trying to get the previous epistemology to, to function again because it doesn't, <laughs> that's literally what's happening. How you process through it are, are much more of these um, Gebserian approaches to uh, attention and awareness, I think. And that what it was so good about a model like this is that it gives you, not, um, a map is two directional, but it gives you a, a medicinal way of, of being with the moment without it destroying you. Um, because as you say, like, in the model, in Ford's model, in Gebs's model, um, a lot of, and it doesn't necessarily mean physically, although uh, I hope, um, doesn't necessarily mean physically, but a lot of people will be destroyed by this process because this is, a, this is what happens when it, when it does. Is it, do you, anyone want to pick up on that? Do you see what I mean? Like, it, I think we have, and I, I, I'm moving it in the direction of um, the course you guys have put together because I'm speculating that that's right where it's situated, which is like, here is how you um, experience what's happening and not be destroyed by it. Uh, <laughs> could I just jump in with something Please. there? About, um, <clears throat> I think about this a lot because, you know, um, practicing and seeing clients and um, I believe that um, it's going to be a very difficult time, I think, for a lot of people. Um, most people are really cut off from their body. And I'm saying that as a somatic psychotherapist and working with the body for over 30 years. And most people actually live from the neck up and very cognitive, very rational. And so, and you can see it in the tissue, the tissue organizes around that where they actually are cut off from their middle. So when I talk to them about their gush or about microorganisms and their microbiome, they have no, like, it's almost like I'm talking a foreign language to them. 
And then the people that I do see that have a relationship with their body and particularly their microbiome and their gut issues and their food and all that, they're in their bodies in a totally different way. And Brent, I'm sure you can attest to this being a Chinese medicine doctor and seeing clients. So it's the people that I feel are rigidified in this Cartesian mechanistic mindset that are going to have the most difficulty because it's almost like they've, I love this word, Jeremy uses it, ossified. They've become concretized, ossified. In other words, um, the mind-body split is actually become internalized in the tissue. And there's not the same connections in the tissue. That's why there's so much heart disease. That's why there's so much autoimmune disease. People are not even befriending their bodies. And their bodies are sort of lost in nowhere land. And, um, you know, there's, you know, Brent, you said attention, intention is so important for the body. I mean, if you have a plant and you pay attention to the plant, the plant responds yep. and it grows and it blossoms. The same with the body. If you pay attention to the body, it responds. It's like an organism in a, on, under a microscope. It will respond. So I think that as things get intensified, the sad thing is people go into fight or flight. There's no sort of sense of being able to rest in their tissue, in their body, in their sense of self. It's like the restlessness of you know, they go up in the head to try to figure out what's going on and what to do and how to do it. And it's like that just concretizes the rational even more when we actually have to actually slow down, take a pause, take a breath, feel into my viscera. <sighs> you know, like, wow, you know, wow. So it's it's really i can see it now that i look i don't know if i said this to you jeremy i look at some people and they look like fossils like there's a fossilized human and then there's this other human that has a sense of fluidity and vascularity to it there's an there's a a receptivity and a responsivity that is not vigilance like this, which is ossified and concretized, but there's this sense of I can be fluid and flexible and resilient. I can turn on a dime if I need to. I can leave my house and all my belongings behind because I'm not attached and rigidified in my identity of who I am. My identity is this becoming, and we are all becoming now. And unless we learn to live in a state of becoming, we're going to get lost in the panic and the um, fear and the craziness and the insanity of, of what's unfolding around us as the structures dissolve and the new ones are not even in place. How does one live in liminality? How does one live in a state of becoming? It's almost like we have to become this super organism now. We have to learn to be really uh, like, you know, staying with the trouble means being symbiotic, being sympoetic, making these like uh, allies and uh, connections and interconnections that are about mutual support and cooperation, not about domination. And how to rest, I think, is going to become extremely important, but not rest as in in my bed or on a chair rest in my tissue, in my body, in my cells, and know that, you know, I'm participating in this just as much as it's participating in me. I'm not doing it. It's being done through me. Love it. Make, Love it. Yeah. yeah. I shared a, um, a quotation from Always Coming Home on Twitter yesterday, my time, um, being is praise. Um, I do not know what there is to believe. And it's that, um, it, it's, it reminds me of what you just said there about um, bringing your attention to you as becoming rather than um, the, the old construction of you as, as, as an ossified and, and discrete entity. It's like a, yeah. um, that, and that's, 
it's it's easier said than done i think <laughs> i think for a lot of people uh what about you brand anything you want to add to that <clears throat> uh just that just that every symptom that the body can possibly produce including the entirety of the deficient mental rational is a calling home to that sense of coming back into oneself so mm. you that's get so migraines you get migraines that's the only way that your body has that's the way your body's getting your attention to tell you listen lie down in a room for three days and don't do anything it's the only ego syntonic way that you can find that you can bring yourself to that state so imagine now that this whole process of the rise of the individual through the mental rational is what has to be brought into contact with the knowing fluidic self that we're trying to make contact with. So the beauty of Gebser is not jettisoning that quality for a kind of pre-rational state, but bringing that awareness in the same manner that Gebser, Gebser talks about the moment of Odysseus Right? Odysseus can say, I am, but he goes under the water and gets thrown up on the beach. Jesus can walk on the water. And so that's the divine, that's the divine being brought into the material. Mm -hmm. That's the only, and, and within that, what is that aspect of the divine? It's the endlessly creative aspect of divine intelligence, which communicates through symbol. Yeah. And when we're present at that moment, and that, in, and therefore that's inclusive of with those waves, you know, there's some some Rune Soup Premium members now doing some angel bothering. Yep. And what's going through that? What's coming through that for me from the furthest from the prime mover as we move back towards the human realm is precisely this process of allowing the divine with all of its multifarious levels of multivalent levels of expression, spirits, angels, demiurges, whatever, to be, to be present to all of those as being also within us, ex those things expressing themselves through us, mm -hmm. our longing for them with their longing for us, that's the whole cosmic explanation yeah. of the process we're trying to reach <laughs> into in the body yeah. and to awesome. find that present within us and in the context of a somatic appointment in the context of a dialogue which reaches the concretion of the spiritual or in a treatment where the divine pivot of the needle contacts that state in the body mm -hmm. it, it begins to emerge it begins yeah. to erupt as Gebser would say it's um, it's actually a good lead in because if I've got this right, and obviously Jeremy, correct me if I have, and I'm getting this via Gary. Um, he he sort of points at the decline of the mental rational beginning earlier than people think. I mean, everyone can kind of point at Descartes and correctly so and whatever, but he goes like right back to the sort of 14th century, um, and and the in some respects, or it's, it's, it's indicated in the emergence of perspective in, in European art which for him. And it's true, it's a, it's a perfectly valid art um, critique that perspectivism shows that humans have separated themselves from the cosmos because they, they've literally found a way of, in order to depict what is in um, Renaissance art, you literally have to stand outside um, the scene to construct the scene. And, and I think that's super interesting because uh, I, I'm, we're working through the uh, custodianship course at the moment. And I remember the, the bit we're looking at, I've been very interested in the development of wages and labor and, and the household through time. And the 14th century, because of the Black Plague, uh, was the moment where, uh, it, it's, an, it's a pivot point in the labor movement because uh, there was a scarcity of labor for the first time in 800 years because everyone had died. So before, before the Black Death, you had a scarcity of land and an abundance of labor. And so you have serfdom and you have no wages. And then you get the Black Death and it changes and it becomes, uh, that's the beginning of, of labor and wages and so on in, in many respects. But what's interesting about that is that it actually folds into Gebs's critique because you're actually monetizing the body. I mean, I'm pro like wages and labor and all the rest of it. But that mode of thinking is a monetization of the body. It's, it's like, well, actually, if you want me to till your fields, you can fucking pay me. Um, it, that one, that's true, but it's a kind of true that folds into his model of we, 
we moved our bodies outside of participation with reality and that's how we get things like perspectivism but also labor and i've just been sitting with that over the weekend in preparation because i'm working on a module now over preparation for the call i'm like that hadn't occurred to me when i first encountered it in gary's work um because i encountered it by the the rise of perspectivism and it's a good critique but i'm like wow actually in the same century we get like wages <laughs> interesting right there you go. yeah no, yeah, that's um, it's very interesting and very relevant to some of my uh, uh, more recent conversations about uh, what integral consciousness means for economics in terms of um, the perspectival world and the integral world, uh, the mental world, I mean, the, the mental perspectival since the Renaissance, since the 1400s. Um, it, it, it is in this process of spatializing the body, spatializing time, spatializing uh, life itself, right? To measure it in that Cartesian sense and to stand apart from it, to extract something abstract from it, right? Um, I find uh, Bruno Latour to be a, a deeply kind of proto-integral thinker in his critique of the process of globalization, which he, which he describes as this process of going out of this world. It is, it is a project in which the utopian um, uh, uh, ideal of capital, right? infinite extraction of wealth, infinite extraction of capital, um, the world in which that is based on doesn't exist. It is an idea. It is a concept, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. uh, the, the body in which capitalists presumes to, to extract that wealth from and labor from doesn't truly exist. We are more than that, right? Mm -hmm. And so a post-capitalist future or an integral future um, is more of a question, right? Is, is, is can we exist and liberate the body from its spatialization in that sense, right? We are embodied, we are material, but not in, not in a totalizing sense of the way in which capital or um, Renaissance artists were imagining it. We are much more in the way that Barbara and, and Brandt are so wonderfully and eloquently uh, expressing the body as an aperspectival body, right? So, so the same question would be with economics. Can there be um, a counterpart to, these qualities and characteristics characteristics of integral consciousness and economics and the sciences, et cetera. And this was Gepser's project in, in the mid century, which has here are the characteristics for, for this integrality that I'm exploring. Let me reach out. And this goes back to what we said in the beginning, how he was moving in all these different circles. He was talking with economists. He was speaking with physicists, right? Um, uh, and Jung and psychologists, et cetera. He wanted to kind of, he was sensitive enough to go, this isn't mine. This is a mutational period. I can evidence this expressing itself in other human beings and other domains of thought in our cultural phenomenology. So it's strengthened and intensified when we do that because suddenly we have a polyphony of ways of expressing what integral consciousness actually is. And so, um, which is why I bring up Latour and some other, and we've been talking about Donna Haraway's work and sympoiesis, right? And the aperspectivity of the body is just a wonderful place to, to begin there as well. Um, so all of these things, I think, corroborate with one another. And I forget your question now, but this is sort of where I was going in, in terms of like aperspectivity, Renaissance, but I love that you're connecting it with, with the, the, the creation of labor and the spatialization of the body in the economic sense. Um, I'll just leave one other note too. Um, Gepser has an interesting way of thinking about this not so much that it's an abstract delineation, but it's sort of when consciousness has fulfilled itself in a particular direction, a, a particular zenith of a, a modality of expression, um, it immediately begins to work on something else. So mm -hmm. there's almost like a withdrawal. And it's not that we consciously um, are, are moving on immediately at that point. We very often stick and ossify and fixate on a particularly deficient expression. So he says, you know, as soon as we've mastered the, the spatial body in the, in the Renaissance, that is immediately when he believes you know, time as this aperspectival expression begins to percolate, be, begins to become uh, move from latency and it begins to gestate this crisis that we are in today. So we could say that even the birth of colonialism, capitalism, et cetera, was the very moment that the integral intensification began to kind of 
um, come forward in our cultural phenomenology. And uh, he mentioned specifically, I always bring this up, James Watt, it was either 1782 or 1784, the invention of the steam engine, the patenting of it. Like Paul Crutzen, like Timothy Morton, he says, you know, that particular moment was very important for this time eruption, this, this sort of prelude to the integral consciousness in the sense, um, in that, you know, the, the, the intensification and the bursting apart of the spatial world was beginning at that point, right? Time would become too much for us to handle, the machine world would leap out of our control. And more than anything, I think, you know, the climate crisis is this wonderful, um, um, a perspectival lesson in time, right? We're dealing with uh, life forms that are millions of years old, perhaps billions, you know, in the deep earth. Um, so there's this deep time sense. We're dealing with um, climate catastrophes that are entangled in, you know, the coal miners of the 1850s, and they're hitting us today in places like Florida or California with global warming or climate events, etc. And then we ourselves are participating in the future every time, every year we don't, you know, scale back these processes. Mm -hmm. So there's this deep sense of temporal entanglement, intensification um, that I think we've even felt, especially this year. I don't know if you've seen like the memes about like um, people talking to their future selves a month from now. Yeah. Um, it, you know, there's, there's all of this, there's this kind of social phenomena and an awareness of, of this time crisis that we're really um, inhabiting right now. So again, I don't know what your question no, is it's anymore. Like, we, we, we hit it anyway, because it was, we ended up talking about when the mental rational went into decline. And I like the way um, Gebza describes that as like consciousness or the great all, once it's mastered something, it moves on to the next thing, right? So it's, it's really interesting to think of the subsequent centuries, because the appearance of perspectivism in art, comparatively benign. I like a lot of Renaissance art, right? Um, but it's like, okay, cool. So that's consciousness getting to that and it gives us Renaissance art. Thank you. But it's almost like the neck, the intervening four centuries, four to five centuries are what happens when you neglect that process. All right, I'm over here now doing this. And you neglect that process and you get the rise of global empires and the destruction of the environment. It's like, what happens when you're not paying attention to it? And I kind of like, not that that's what he says. It's just interesting to sit with the idea of the mental rational having effectively been uh, an, an underparented child for the last five centuries uh, is kind of fun uh, to, to think with because what, what was so sensitive I think about his aeonics model is kind of that like because if you if you move if you use that as the metaphor that consciousness masters something and moves on to the next thing what's fascinating that he situates it in the appearance of the renaissance is that in, at least in European culture we can track what consciousness was interested in after that, because we have the Hermetic revival and then the Hermetic underground, right? And the Hermetic underground is behind um, all the kind of, like, people think this is a bad word, but like the illuminist and, and humanist projects of, of Europe, which include things like, um, you know, universal education, um, universal voting for men and women, all that kind of stuff all comes out of the Hermetic underground and it's kind of moving into, it's sort of finding its way to that new experience of time. So it's a really fun kind of thing to sit with. But um, I guess we are, as you mentioned, with the memes in 2020 being the sum of all disaster movies. Uh, tell us as we, we finish up this chat about the, the upcoming course, because uh, I, presume, I presume that's why now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. Yeah, I'll just uh, briefly mention a, a few notes about it. So, so uh, I invited Barbara and Brandt on and a few other of my colleagues, including uh, Debashish uh, Banerjee, who's the chair of East-West Psychology at uh, CIS, um, in integral yoga scholar. Um, I consider him a mentor and, and, and a good friend. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, uh, as well as uh, Jared Jaynes, who is working on, I believe it's called Evolving Ground, which sounds very synonymous with what we're talking about here. Um, and he's coming on as well, but uh, it's going to be a biweekly uh, live Zoom series, and we're also going to have uh, pre recorded modules. Um, and very similar to uh, earlier in this year's Gepser course, you know, we're going to be examining and exploring these structures of consciousness. We're having all of these wonderful, brilliant people on to kind of bring different angles to it. And the idea is really to, to embody integral consciousness, to really kind of lean into and stay with the trouble and become present. And um, 
I've developed some very like hold them lightly, you know, like the way of no way kind of thing. There is no like the integral TM practice module or anything like that, but there's, there's ways in which we can bring um, an integral approach to our various practices. And so I've offered some very light practices in terms of um, day-to-day kind of integra- integrality, reminding us of the different modes and experiences of time, et cetera. And I've been developing these with, um, with a, a few of my colleagues, including Barbara and Brent, in terms of just how do we learn to become present day-to-day? And that's really the emphasis of this. We're not going to be reading through ever-present origin. We're just going to be kind of drawing from uh, certain excerpts, certain um, particular modalities that resonate. And that's the idea is to, um, in the embodied sense, in the consciousness sense, to become fluid, become plastic, to become open. And I think that's really what it comes down to. And what we're all saying is, how do we cultivate presence and really become open to the present, right? The spiritual present. It's radically, in a profoundly difficult way, very simple. You know, it is the contemplative challenge. And, and so, yeah, uh, I'm really looking forward to it. And we're going to be, it's called Cohering the Radical Present. And it starts on October, October 4th on a Sunday. So uh, everyone's nice welcome to, to join us. And the, sh- the details for that in the show notes. Uh, and for how they find you guys, um, the other two, Barbara, thank you very much for being with us. I think this is going to be a fun course. But for people who want to know more about yourself and your work in particular, where do they go? What do they do? They can go to barbaracarlson.com. And that's my website, and they can contact me there. Nice one. Brent? Uh, BrantStickley.com, um, at StyloStixis on Twitter, and an ongoing secretive uh, performance art piece on Facebook as well. <laughs> <laughs> I like it. Well, um, guys, this has been a great chat. Uh, honestly uh, really really insightful and fun stuff and 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 um yeah thank you very much and i'm looking forward to yeah. to how this all goes thank you so thank much all righty i'm gonna hit the stop button <laughs>